Hi, I'm Nick Palmashano. And I'm Matt Finney. And this is the Bad News Network. <music> 75 days. There are 75 days until the election that most people are calling the most important of our lifetime. Everyone on my Facebook and Twitter feeds have opinions about various political topics and even the constitutionality of these things. But yet, when I see them actually shape their arguments, I'm often shocked by the juxtaposition of how little they actually know about the things they're talking about versus how strongly they feel about their positions. 37% of all Americans can't enumerate a single right that is protected by the First Amendment. Only 26% of all Americans, one in freaking four, can name all three branches of government. 33%, one third of all Americans can't name a single branch of government. About one fifth of all Americans can't name the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. One third of all Americans can't name their governor. And a lot of people are quick to scoff at this and blame the other guy or the other party. But let's take a hard look at this. In a test given to college seniors in the top quintile of all universities, 80% scored a D or an F on what is essentially a high school civics test. So in the best universities that we have, almost everybody doesn't understand basic civics. Four out of five people don't know how the government works. For f sake, about half of these people didn't realize that Congress actually declares war and not the president. Half of these students didn't know term lengths for senators or representatives. Almost no one understood the reason for or had read the Federalist Papers. Most have no idea that we're a republic or what that even means. Folks, this is a problem. Most people right now are very sure about who they are voting for in the next election, but yet they have no idea how the system works or even what their candidates actually stand for. If you don't know how to use the machine, your opinion on how the machine works is useless. A lot of people don't realize that when the Constitution was actually written, the Electoral College was made up of actual delegates, real people. You didn't directly vote for the president. Your state chose delegates that would go and represent the state in electing the president. Those delegates were trusted members of society with a robust knowledge of politics, business, and science. They would then go to the convention, discuss and debate, and elect the candidate they felt was best. The vision was that each of these educated men would vote their conscience. Well, shortly thereafter, with the advent of political parties, that idea kind of went away and it ended up being a straight party line vote. Then many states decided that if a state was won by a candidate, then they would get all of the delegates as opposed to, you know, each delegate voting their own conscience. So the system went further and further away from the original intent. The title of being a member of the Electoral College essentially became an honorary one. This is a good thing, right? One person, one vote. In theory, yes. That's fair, right? The problem comes in when everyone voting is ignorant as f Doctors don't ask dudes on the street how to perform surgery. Plumbers don't ask random people how to fix a water main. But everybody, regardless of how little they know, gets to vote for president, your representatives, and your senators. And because so few people have taken the time to learn anything about our government, the issues of the day, or our current politicians, we repeatedly get people that none of us would even hire, never mind try to elect to the biggest office in the land. One of the biggest variables when it comes to voting for many Americans is would I want to have a beer with this person? Why? Is that how we choose our surgeons? Is that how we choose our electricians? Is that how we choose our accountants? Of course not. We want somebody that has a history of success in a particular area if they're gonna work on something that's important to us. We rate them on their skill, their expertise, and their plan for doing a job for us. Now, I'm not saying that we should go back to the original electoral college. I'm saying that I spent the last 24 years watching people brutally criticize presidents and the last 12 hammering presidents 
so unreasonably on everything, and most of you don't know anything. Most of you don't even vote. So our situation is all your fault. 75 days. You have 75 days to educate yourself and make sure that you are an informed voter. Basic civics is really easy. Learn how the government works. Read your candidate's actual official platform. You might be surprised at what you see. Everyone running in this election has a history. There are no neophytes. Assess their actual achievements and proposed policies, not the sound bites that you see on news shows. Compare them to your personal views using an informed understanding of the Constitution as your metric of success. Then vote for who you believe in, feeling very comfortable that you know why you're doing it. I'm not saying this to be condescending. I've consistently found that people that watch BNN are far more informed than the average citizen, oftentimes more informed than we are. But if you were listening to those questions at the beginning of this monologue and you couldn't answer them, ask yourself if you are doing your civic duty as an American citizen. If the answer is no, no problem. You have 75 days to fix it. For those scholars out there, by all means, recommend some books in the comment section that we should all read to become better informed. Let's get better together, guys. 75 days. One of the hottest stories in the news this week has been the record-setting temperatures in Death Valley. Temperatures on Sunday reached 130 degrees, a new record. Some sources stated that the previous record of 134 degrees recorded in 1913 still held up, but scientists spoke up and said that scientists of old were uglier and dumber. However, this does top the recorded temperature in 2013 of 129 degrees. So what does this all mean? Did a portal to hell open up in the US? Probably not. But smart people have cautioned that while every year a natural increase in temperatures will occur, the baseline for that has been steadily increased by human industry. The word is, as it has been for years, that Greenhouse gases and the burning of fossil fuels have steadily increased this baseline so that basically, when that natural increase does occur, it's starting with a head start. Short version, we're expanding our infrastructure and industry at the cost of cooking ourselves and the earth. And of course, if you're a Democrat, this is all Trump's fault. The Democratic National Convention took place this week, officially naming Joe Biden as their candidate. The convention that took place virtually was far stronger than many recent performances, with many powerful speeches, and one that made you go, hmm. I'll start with the hmm. Donna Hilton was allowed to speak at the convention, which angered many Republicans and Democrats alike. For those of you that don't know, Hilton was sentenced to 27 years in prison for kidnapping a gay man and then torturing him for three weeks, including squeezing his testicles with a pair of pliers and raping him repeatedly with a metal pole before finally killing him. She was listed as a community activist and prison reformer. I don't care what you think about forgiveness and reform. Whoever put her up there is absolutely stupid. It's such shocking bad judgment and it's gonna be one of those defining memes hitting social media nonstop for the next month. That woman should be in prison or dead, not speaking on a national level, talking about how the country should be shaped. But enough about that nonsense, let's get to the meat. There were some misses, like having the mayor of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot, talk about the impact of systemic racism and the importance of the Black Lives Matter movement while she actually has police securing her own neighborhood and nowhere else while the rest of the city of Chicago burns to the literal ground. Then you had the Clintons. Hillary Clinton came off as more bitter than inspiring and didn't do a lot to help Joe Biden. Bill Clinton, on the other hand, gave a solid speech, but the pall of his sexual impropriety continues to hang over him, especially as more and more information comes to light. On the whole, though, the Democrats stacked the deck. John Kasich, Michelle Obama, and Tammy Duckworth stand out as having particularly strong performances. But the real one, two, three punch was President Obama, Senator Kamala Harris, and Vice President Joe Biden. Obama and Harris did the dirty work. And while we expect that from Harris, it broke protocol and the general sense of who President Obama is to see him go after Trump aggressively. They know the difficulty of the job and it's a very small club. It also does little of value to use their influence to divide the country further. But Obama chose to go after Trump aggressively and in no uncertain terms calling into a question whether our democracy would even exist if Trump were to be reelected. 
It was a big speech and an indication that Obama, a very popular and still influential politician, was going to spend the next 75 days campaigning hard for Biden. But the convention belonged to Biden. He's been hit repeatedly during this campaign cycle with a decrease in cognitive function, but he absolutely rocked this speech. It wasn't a campaign speech in a normal sense. It sounded a lot more like a State of the Union address. He struck a tone of optimism and unity and a call for common decency, which is a tone that we haven't seen from any politician of either party in quite some time. The Republicans will respond next week with a convention in Charlotte. The president, for his part, has promised a blockbuster event. In more of the news we all know and love, coronavirus might be close to meeting its match. A UK company called AstraZeneca has announced that it's come up with a working vaccine that may be able to go toe to toe with the COVID. The company works in conjunction with Oxford University, so it's basically a bunch of smart kids that smell of tweed jackets, so you know you can trust them. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison addressed the Aussie press with confidence and then completely glossed over a short statement about how hard it is and what big hurdles there are to create a successful vaccine. He didn't elaborate on that at all, actually, but he's super pumped to release the semi-solution that some smart people have middling confidence in. Still, it's probably better than Russia's. Anyways, Morrison said his plan is to release the vaccine for free to the Australian public. He also said that he will make it as mandatory as possible, and later corrected that statement by saying, when he said mandatory, he didn't mean mandatory, he meant mostly mandatory. The United States government, for their part, has purchased 300 million of these vaccines. The last 30 million of us will be given sharp sticks and left to fend for ourselves. 47-year-old man was cured of indefinite drunkenness because of feces or fecal matter. Poop. I'm just going to call it poop. The man had something called gut fermentation syndrome, or as I like to call it, free booze syndrome. This syndrome gives the individual the feeling of being perpetually wasted. The man was given something called a microbiota transplant, a poop transplant, and the donor was none other than his 22-year-old daughter. This was said to be the first successful transplant, which scientists have called a huge win, but everybody else has called simply a buzzkill. I'm sorry, that was a joke. School has started back up for many, with most classes being online or some sort of hybrid. Tuition has also increased across the country, or at the very least stayed the same. Because who doesn't love paying the same or more for less? In North Carolina, UNC has already been sent home. Students arrived a week ago, and in that short time, the school reported five hotspots and over 130 new coronavirus cases. There are also 400 other students in isolation for potential infection. This isn't an isolated case either, this is everywhere. The high school in Georgia that suspended two kids for taking pictures of their crowded halls also sent everyone home. I'll take things that everyone knew would happen for 600, Alex. A man in upstate South Carolina has offered a $20,000 reward for the return of his prized possessions. What were those prized possessions, you may ask? Family heirlooms or antiques? Maybe Action Comics number one, the first appearance of Superman? Or the Ark of the Covenant? No, they were none other than his prized racing pigeons. I'm not gonna lie, I had no idea that racing pigeons were a thing, but now I kind of want some. Anyway, apparently they are a thing, and they're worth a load of money. John Georgeopoulos had more than 100 racing pigeons stolen from the coop in his backyard. The pigeons were worth between $1,000 and $20,000 each. I'm not sure who's paying that much for a pigeon, but I am clearly in the wrong profession. Some of these pigeons have won races that have earned John more than $100,000. Apparently, John is a well-known figure in the pigeon racing community, and he believes these were stolen to keep him from winning the big bucks. The wires to his security camera were cut, and if the birds were released, they would just return home. So this looks like the work of the dastardly bird racing mafia. If anyone has any information about the stolen pigeons, John has asked that you reach out to the Greenville County Sheriff's Office. Alternatively, you could just go to your local park and nab, I don't know, 20 of these sky rats and then return them to George for a cool 20K. This week, scientists have gotten the go-ahead to spice things up in Florida as if Florida wasn't spicy enough already. A plan to release over 750 million genetically modified mosquitoes has been approved. The plan is to see if these genetically modified mosquitoes are a viable option to just spraying insecticides to control the current mosquito population. 
The modified mosquitoes called OX5034 have been modified so that the females die in the larval stage. The females, which are the only ones that bite for blood, would be unable to pass on diseases like Zika, Dengue, and Yellow Fever. Trials of similar mosquitoes were tested in the Cayman Islands, Panama, and Brazil and showed a drastic reduction in the current mosquito population. Some health officials are still up in arms that the testing didn't fully go through with these and also that the money allocated to this could probably be put elsewhere. But honestly, these scientists in Florida should just be happy that someone didn't pull dinosaur DNA out of one of these bad boys and kick off another life-ending event in 2020. On Thursday, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi rejected the idea of accepting a lower-level stimulus bill, claiming that strategically it doesn't make sense right now. She alluded to the fact that if she accepted the proposal as is, that Republicans would just move on, and she wanted to make sure that her constituency got everything that she felt they deserved. Her critics counter that she simply wants people to suffer leading up to the election in order to hurt the Republican Party. That sounds pretty right, and it's almost exactly what she said herself in that strategic comment. So yeah. No upside for Democrats passing a stimulus bill that they don't really want, because unhappy voters tend to blame the current administration. Don't you just love politics? Steve Bannon, one of the chief engineers of President Trump's campaign, was charged with three other people for fraud and stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars from a fundraiser to build Trump's wall. He was arrested by the United States Post Office with assistance from the United States Coast Guard on his private yacht. As he was being dragged away, he was quoted as saying, if you're gonna go, go postal. Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny is in a hospital in a coma this week after being poisoned for the second time. According to his staff, Alexei began feeling ill while on a flight leaving the Siberian airport. He soon lost consciousness and collapsed and was taken to a nearby hospital in Siberia where he's now in a coma and on a ventilator. His team said that he was definitely poisoned and believed it was from the tea he drank earlier, which they say was the only thing he ingested. Navalny had his fair share of turbulence over the years, which is to be expected. He has actively opposed Putin and has tried to make his way through Russian politics, trying to oust both Putin and his United Russia party. In 2018, he tried to enter the election to oppose Putin, but was banned from the election. He started a foundation called Navalny's Foundation for Fighting Corruption, which was aimed at finding and ousting corrupt officials. This had to be shut down after a long, drawn-out court battle with a pro-Putin, wealthy businessman. Last week, the president of Belarus blamed him for all the protests that have been going on over the past few weeks, but offered no evidence to the accusation. Needless to say, it's not easy being the opposition leader, and it's definitely putting your life at risk. And finally, in Florida Man News, it's been a slow week in Florida Man News. There's a few really bad, typical Florida stories, like a guy with a child porn stash, another dude wielding a machete, but nothing that really has meat. The one I decided to go with was 82-year-old Kerry Devan. This Florida man crashed his golf cart in a golf cart tunnel. Police arrived on the scene to find Kerry reeking of alcohol and stumbling around. When questioned, Kerry told police he had been watching President Trump on television for a while, and that made him mad. So he was forced to drink vodka because of all the things that President Trump had said. Kerry then explained to the police that he felt fine to drive despite not being able to stand up on his own without leaning on something. Kerry Devan was arrested after crashing the cart. It seemed that Florida man had just too much news and too much booze. And with that, I'm Nick Palmashano. And I'm Matt Finney. And this is the Bad News Network. Our news is at least as bad as the news you're getting already. And remember, if you order a pizza with the Dalai Lama, make sure it's one with everything. As always, you can get 25% off at rangerup.com using the code BNN. Have a great weekend.